The Shining has a nearly secret character that I want to cover today because it changes everything. Hi guys, I'm Megan, and welcome to another Shining Theory on the Fangirl. If you missed my last video, I went into detail about how Jack Torrance is Shining too, even though he probably doesn't know it. This time though, I want to talk about another character that is basically hidden in plain sight. Bear with me here, but do you know what makes The Shining such an incredibly engrossing film? It's not really the script as much as those nuanced details. For The Shining, the devil really is in those details, and it gives us a character that nobody really talks about. And even though this character does not have a name, you definitely feel their presence in the movie. Also, just a friendly reminder, don't leave me comments that say, well, you should read the book because in the book it explains A, B, and C and Stephen King hated the movie. The book and the movie are not the same thing, so let's just agree to disagree and continue analyzing the movie. So let's get into this. Who could I possibly be talking about? The camera angle. And no, I'm not just some movie nerd geeking out about how they frame the shots, although we totally could geek out about that forever. And not to put too fine a point on it, but the camera angle is 100% what's missing from Dr sleep. But after watching The Shining on a nearly endless loop, I really started to notice how dynamic the camera movement is. The Overlook is a huge hotel, so we could have been given a million different shots in a million different ways. But instead, we have a lot of these tracking shots. Let me throw up some examples and just talk right over them. When we're watching Jack or Wendy walking around, we often see the camera in front of them to where we see their faces while they're moving. That's not any kind of uncommon way to film characters moving around a large venue, but in The Shining, the camera is often twisting and turning until we get this sense of a very disorienting maze-like space. Even when we're in this big open area like the kitchen, it still looks like we're in a maze from the camera's perspective. In fact, it feels so jumbled up that if we, the viewers, had to suddenly run through the movie set ourselves, we wouldn't know where we were or how to escape. So that not only feels very entrapping to the viewer, almost claustrophobic despite being this very large open space, but the camera actually feels like it's pulling the characters forward. It's as if the characters aren't moving on their own, they're being led by the hotel, or they're being pulled by some unseen force. And you can't say that the camera is just following the character's path because usually the camera view is turning before the characters do, so the camera is the leader. It knows where they're headed. Well, okay, it's not really the camera that's doing this, it's who or whatever is behind this voyeuristic point of view. So yeah, it's representational, but since that character doesn't get a name, it's basically the camera. And it gets especially interesting in the gold room scenes because we have the camera pulling Jack forward to the party lounge, but it doesn't lead him into the bar itself. The camera viewpoint sits there and waits for Jack to choose to walk into the gold room, and then the same thing happens happens when Wendy runs down the hall a few minutes later. Despite being in this huge hotel and having no idea where her husband is, somehow the camera pulls her into the gold room and waits for her to enter of her own accord. Now, when I was trying to talk this idea out with my husband Daniel, he came up with the notion of Christianity and free will. It's not really my thing, so I'll take his word for it. Basically, the devil can bring you to a scenario, but you have to choose whether or not to do the good or bad thing. So in Jack case, entering the gold room and drinking is something that's presented to him, but he ultimately has to be the one to make the choice of whether or not to do it. Another similar phrase would be, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. You know, you can give a man all the booze in the world, but you can't force him to consume it. So even though all the opportunity to do bad things is right there in front of you, you, or rather Jack Torrance, has to actively decide to snap. And if you're one of those people who think I'm just overreaching here, let me show you the scene that made this theory happen. One of the most iconic but meaningless moments in The Shining is watching Danny ride his tricycle in the Overlook. The camera angle, the sounds, the contrasting colors, it's almost hypnotic. But Danny riding his bike has very little value as a storytelling device, so why spend so much time following him on that thing? Well, to follow Danny. That 
is the key point. Where the hotel is dragging Jack and Wendy along, it's following Danny. The overlook doesn't lead Danny, but rather it almost hunts him. Maybe it's because he's a child who's afraid, or maybe it's because the hotel is craving his shine like Dr. Sleep suggests. But more often than not, Danny is being followed by the camera in this very lurking, unsettling way. And he's not alone. Dick Holleran, our psychic who doesn't see the axe to the chest coming, gets a very intriguing camera shot too. After Danny shines out to Dick as like an SOS and gets Dick to hop on a plane and fly back to the Overlook, watch what the camera is doing. The camera is in front of Dick, but it's not pulling him forward like it often does for Jack. Instead, the camera is further back and moves in closer as Dick walks towards the lens. Then, the camera camera waits at the doorway and follows Dick into the next room, almost like it's stalking him. And Dick is being hunted by the house in a way, so this camera movement truly makes the scene feel incredible. Finally, when we get to the end of the movie and Jack is chasing Danny through the maze, the camera shifts. The camera is pulling Jack through the maze and then switches to chasing Jack, really going back and forth a lot. It's like the entity that possesses the Overlook Hotel is losing control over Jack. They can't keep him in their grip anymore. Or maybe he just got too far outside of the house and that affects how they can influence Jack. But either way, we visually see that the invisible camera character can't hold on to Jack. So what do they do? They let him go. No more ghosts egging him on or coming to his rescue. Because hey, hey now, Delbert Grady already rescued Jack from one freezer. Everybody gets one. So as soon as Danny gets away, which seems to be the hotel's primary target, the spirits that be just let Jack freeze to death because he's useless to them now. It's almost like Jack failed his mission, so the hotel let him die in order to reclaim him. They could have helped Jack live longer or help him go after his family after the snow all falls and goes away, but the hotel or spirits or however this works, they didn't want to deal with that. The house let Jack die so that it could absorb him into their catalog of spirits. You know, like the haunted mansion, except none of the haunts are happy. And that could potentially give us another answer as to why Jack was in the 4th of July ball picture that was dated 1921, I think. Because even though the movie is set in 1980, the house has taken Jack into its collective. And hmm, time really wouldn't be a factor anymore at that point. Well, I hope that this has been a convincing theory that there's an unseen character in The Shining. Whether that character be an invisible form of Grady or a collective of spirits or just the demonic aura of the hotel, whatever. I'm not sure and it really doesn't matter, but I am very confident that this film gives us a very haunted, stalked, closed off feeling for a reason. And having the camera angle be an invisible mystery character is a great reason, I would say. It might not be reality, but theories are more fun. Who could I possibly be talking about? Who could I possibly be talking about? Who could I possibly be talking about? Well, family members, we're almost done, but I want to invite you to hang out with me in some other places. I'm on Twitter and Instagram as my own personal self, and I have a Facebook page too, but I mostly just post photos over there. And sometimes people say, hey, McGann, I want to mail you something. How do I do that? Easy. Just click the About tab on my channel page, and my most current P.O. Box info will be right there. I also run another channel, The Family. It's really a hodgepodge channel where we might post anything. Oh yeah, and I also sell shirts and stickers and stuff with the family and the fangirl logos. If that is your cup of tea, I have a link in every description of every video. Finally, if you want to help out the fangirl channel and make sure I'm putting out video essays for years to come, the best way you can help is by subscribing and watching more of my videos, whether they're new, old, whatever. Maybe even share one or two on social media, help spread the word. People who watch to the end of videos like you helps to tell the site, hey, this is a good video. We should recommend it to other people. So if you made it this far, leave me a comment of something like, hey, I made it to the end. Love ya. See you next time, family members. Bye.